Agency, Winnipeg Ninduji, um, Zaganash Kwe Ninda. Um, my name is Adele Perry, I've already said that. I'm a professor of history and women's and gender studies at the University of Manitoba, where I also wear another hat, which is the director of the Center for Human Rights Research. And it's in that capacity that I am really honored to be a part of today's discussion. Um, I'm a settler raised in the shared territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people and have lived um, for the last two decades and even a little more and worked here amongst the Anishinaabe, Inanu, and Métis territories and people governed by the promises of Treaty 1 and also of the Manitoba Act, um, where we drink water from Treaty 3. These are some of the places and relationships that are brought into view when we mark Earth Day by discussing land back. Earth Day is a really important time for the Center for Human Rights um, research to host a discussion of land back and what it means for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples and communities and the territories we inhabit. The call for land back speaks directly to two of the CHRR's research foci, and those are Indigenous people and human rights and also the right to food and water. Raising questions of land back on Earth Day provides us with an opportunity to highlight the connections between environmental degradation and colonialism, racism, and dispossession, and address how Indigenous rights and the right to food and water are connected to the restoration of Indigenous lands and waters. We're very lucky to do so in partnership um, with the University of Manitoba's Office of the Vice President Indigenous and today the David Suzuki Foundation. Um, at the core of today's event is the screening of a video and I think it is indeed the prairie premiere of this video, um, which is one of three that the David Suzuki Foundation has produced um, on land back and what it means. Um, we'll be screening one of these videos and invite you to follow up and view the other ones on the David Suzuki Foundation website. And you can find the link in, in the chat here. Um, today, we are being joined by um, the producers of today's film, including Amy Kraft, who is also a law professor at the University of Ottawa, an author, uh, a scholar, and um, a long-term friend of the Center for Human Rights Research, whose involvement and leadership we have very much appreciated. We'll also be joined by Danielle Morrison, who is a University of Manitoba alumni, a lawyer, an artist, and in every possible sense of the term, a leader. Danielle's voice is the one you will hear narrating in the video. We will also be joined by Taylor Galvin and Taylor is an environmental studies student getting ready for her final exams this interesting year at the University of Manitoba. And she's also the president of Manitoba Indigenous Concerns um, on the Environment. So um, with that, I think I'm gonna turn things briefly over to Aime, who's gonna talk a little bit about, about the video. We're gonna watch the video. We're gonna to return to people's um, responses to the video and to questions of land back. Thank you, I'll turn things over to you, Aime. Great, thank you, Adele. Um, and welcome everyone, Boju. I'm joining you from Treaty One territory in Winnipeg. I know some of you um, may be outside of the, the city of Winnipeg, but it's a beautiful day here and a wonderful way to celebrate our lands and waters by coming together to have this essential conversation about uh, what land back can mean. And you'll see in this series of videos that there are a variety of different perspectives on that. And I would encourage each of you to grapple with that question, uh, what it might mean for you and in relation to the lands that you belong to. Uh, but we'll get into that after we've had a chance to watch this, uh, this third video in the series together. So the videos themselves uh, deal with past, present, and future. That's kind of how they're structured, but this is really all about how we navigate into the future uh, and think about land back as a concept that can help us have right relationships and good relationships within our, um, our different contexts. The uh, series of videos was put together uh, through some uh, hard, hard work of an amazing and dedicated team that, um, uh, that built on the, the knowledge that was gifted by each of the speakers that you'll hear in the video. And the uh, three videos emanate from a conversation that Rachel Plotkin of David Suzuki Foundation and I had a few years ago, uh, where Rachel approached me with the idea of having uh, webinars and discussions. I think at that time we were still in person, um, having some discussions about what land back could mean. And one of the things that uh, I, I mentioned was that Often we're starting from scratch and we're having conversations 
um, without the same base of knowledge. So the three videos were meant to ensure that we could hear a variety of perspectives, come to the discussion informed uh, with a, a common base of knowledge that's delivered through these three, three videos, and then to more deeply engage in the conversation and solutions that we could um, that we could explore collectively uh, through mediums like this, this webinar. So that's a, a brief introduction to the videos. Um, we'll watch the last one that has some uh, pragmatic suggestions on how we might approach uh, land back. And then we'll have more of a conversation uh, amongst the panelists. So thank you again for joining us. And I wanna acknowledge Rachel who's on the screen here for uh, her hard work and, uh, and visionary perspective on, on these conversations. Canada is built on the dispossession of Indigenous lands. To envision a better future, we must explore and acknowledge our collective histories and ask ourselves, how does this future build on the rights and responsibilities of Indigenous peoples and their long-standing governance of their territories? Non-Indigenous people need to educate themselves on the history of colonization in this country and on Indigenous governance and justice. That education is essential to being able to uh, be in good relation and act in ethical ways in relation to Indigenous people. I think there's so much to understand about the histories, and I'm saying histories as plural, of Canada in terms of uh, Indigenous relations with land and sort of colonial imposition of systems of land taking. This idea that somehow Canada became um, part of Britain, that, that the Crown could assume sovereignty within Indigenous territories where there were already sovereign people within those territories, is the basis of how we understand Canadian law and Canadian property law. So all of these property interests that everyone has are based on this idea that there was no one in this territory and that it was discovered and we know that to be factually incorrect. We have to remember that the lands were systematically stolen from Indigenous people and it started when of course the French and the British started to lay claim on these lands. They started to lay their flags on these lands and started to assume title over them and that was all through the doctrine of discovery which basically was, if you could go out there and find lands that didn't have Christians, you could take their lands. The crisis in the present is based on the injustice of how this country was first confederated. 89% of the lands in this country have been designated as crown or public lands, roughly divided between federal and provincial governments. That claim to underlying title by the Crown of Indigenous lands is the foundation for the relationship of domination between the Crown and Indigenous people in Canada. So at the time of the British North America Act, all jurisdictional powers were divided between the federal and provincial governments and there was no role for First Nations or Indigenous people more generally to play in the jurisdiction and governance of their lands. We weren't involved in Confederation. Um, which is a fundamental failing of ultimately uh, democracy on this place. And it means that Canada, you know, as, as a sort of legal entity, has a pretty specious claim on this territory, right? It, it's, its claim is really one of occupancy. How are we any different than an occupying army or an occupying force? if we're on lands for which we have no consent to be here, unless we do learn about what the consent protocols are to be here in a good way and to live in relation to Indigenous law and governance. If we look at the British North American Act, if you actually read the text of it, it's basically setting up a corporation, not a country, uh, right? An, an extractionist corporation that's meant to take the resources from this land and export them to Europe, that was, that's literally the origins uh, of this country. And truthfully, what we need is for Canada itself to recognize that the path it's chosen won't actually resolve what it's after either, which is its own sovereignty. That, that Canada can never be a sovereign nation uh, unless it understands our sovereignty. Canada is a nation 
whose wealth comes from the land and waters. But then why are the people who cared for the land for thousands of years the poorest among us? Much of Canada is designated crown land, when in fact it is indigenous land. A lot of people see Mother Earth as like an object, the, the earth, the water, the air, not as a spirit. There's the possibility then though to misunderstand this idea of not owning land as being uh, somehow okay with the idea that it's up to be taken by others. I think that's a, an interesting starting point for the discussion, is that idea of ownership being the wrong framework. If there were no treaties, um, there's no rightful way for people to be within our territories. The treaties that we made were agreements to share in the resources and share in the territory in ways that were respectful of uh, Indigenous jurisdiction and maintaining Indigenous jurisdiction over time. That's not the reality of how treaties have been implemented in Canada, and I think the Crown has a very skewed view of what treaties are meant to achieve. The way that the Crown interpreted those treaties, though, was gradually over time to diminish the governance role of Indigenous people through the treaty process and to minimize them as basically contractual agreements that over the years became smaller and smaller and smaller uh, rights to their lands, resources and territories. The way that, that land management is, uh, has been created was from colonial property law. I mean, that was the whole intention, was to erase us as a people. So the Canadian state uh, is a very complex concept, especially in relation to what we'll call natural resources. There's this devolution from Canada to provinces of these natural resources and lands within the province, all under this guise of the crown, like this magic hat of the crown. If you talk to treaty rights holders across the country, they don't consider their lands to be ceded. Indigenous people did not cede or surrender their lands. They agreed to share jurisdiction with the state under particular circumstances. I think if our ancestors looked at where we are today, they wouldn't understand this. This is not what they imagined. They thought we could live together. And so in, in that spirit, that's sort of how I approach all these things too, is that that's living true to our, what they imagined. When Canada formed and became its own country, they created something called the Indian Act, which was to force people off their traditional lands, have them contained onto the reservations, and then filtered into colonization so that they would never ever become a threat to resource extraction. Because Canada had a mandate for a free-for-all in resource extraction. You know, before that, we had our own sustainable economies on the land. We ha had our own governments. We had our own laws. And that we're an indigenous species in our ecosystems. And it was very pivotal for the Canadian government to remove us from the ecology because we're the natural land protectors. We're the natural water protectors because our cultural history is embedded right into the very land itself. When we were removed, it caused like a domino effect and it allowed the resource extraction to take place, which is now causing an ecological collapse. When those colonial laws, especially the Indian Act came into place, you know, it was a total erasure of the role that Indigenous women have had uh, to be decision makers. The creation of reservations was outside of that original, even treaty relationships, if there was a treaty. All of a sudden we have these little squares of, of land under the Indian Act. And when I think of reservations, I think of cages, I think of animal reservations. Let's cage people up. Looking at it from a time in which dozens of Indigenous nations were allied with Great Britain during the American Revolution and then subsequent to that, the uh, War of 1812. And at that time, the Indigenous nations were utilizing their full agency as sovereign nations in their negotiations and, and relations uh, with the Crown. 
after their usefulness was done, indigenous peoples were sort of swept aside. Around 1830, when those policies went from one of respecting the nationhood of First Nations to treating them as wards of the emerging Canadian government. And those policies that emerged were you know, paternalistic uh, policies and policies designed to essentially dispossess indigenous peoples from their lands and resources. That's sort of the uh, uh, quick summation <laughs> of, uh, of uh, Canadian history. As an indigenous person, I don't get my rights from the treaty. I have inherent Anishinaabek responsibilities on these lands. Our history as Haudenosaunee peoples, as Omohawe, as indigenous peoples, it goes way back a long time before Canada ever existed. So now we're dealing, you know, with the, that historical violent relationship and having to deal with a whole framework, a whole society that's been built on colonial law. I think it would be a collective societal and environmental mistake not to rely on the wisdom of nations that have been in connection with territory for thousands of years. And I go right back to the two row. The whole intention was for us to live together. Our laws are always about that responsibility or relationships, uh, reciprocity. It isn't until we bring in the colonial law that all of a sudden we're talking about rights. And even the whole concept of rights was also based on an individual. That isn't how we think of things. It isn't just about me. It's about my responsibility to, to all of the above, my family, my clan, my community, my nation. If you have somebody that has a right to that glass of water, and then you have somebody else that has a right to that glass of water, and you have somebody else that has a right to that glass of water, it becomes a conflict. But when you have three people that are responsible for that glass of water, it changes the whole narrative. It changes the whole feeling. Everyone talks about their rights, but in Anishinaabe, we talk about our responsibilities. My responsibility to the waters, I'm born into that responsibility being in Anishinaabe Kwe. It's my obligation to protect water. That was our teachings, that you actually see the faces of our children in the land. And if you see the faces of the children in your land, it's alive. I want to um, thank um, Rachel and Aime and Danielle and everybody who has been involved in producing what I think are really, really powerful videos and ones that I've known for a perfect length for teaching, um, something I've always got an eye on. Um, and I thought we'd begin our conversation afterwards by raising the question um, of first impressions to the video, but also of, of what land back um, means to all of our panelists. So I'm wondering if maybe, Danielle or Taylor wanted to begin um, either with your general responses to the video uh, and also the question of what land back means to you. I guess we can just, somebody just go. <laughs> Jump right in there, Taylor, yeah. <laughs> sure, no problem. So um, first, I'll, I'll begin with like the uh, response to, to the video. And mm -hmm. one of the things that really, really stood out to me the most is this conversation regarding responsibilities versus rights. Um, and sometimes it's kind of hard to decipher between the two in your like in your everyday life, right? So after watching this video, I kind of, it's giving me a different perspective on how to view certain things that that happen on a daily basis. So um, I want to thank everybody for for sharing that. But also, um, like thinking about this, the land back movement and getting, getting 
um, territories and lands back to to the Anishinaabe people or or uh, the Cree or the Oji Cree, what have you, I think is it's a conversation that is not uh, heard of enough, especially today. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to bring up is that this year is quite significant for I'm from Broken Head Ojibwe Nation in Treaty 1 territory, and this year is very significant as it's the 150th anniversary of the signing of Treaty 1. And um, I do work with the Treaty 1 Nation on in preparation of these celebrations, and it's it makes me, makes me wonder after watching these videos, like what has actually been done uh, mm -hmm. to reflect this big anniversary, this signing of this of this first treaty across Canada, how is land back and land governance how are they being affected or neglected or 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 how are in uh, how are indigenous people's words and thoughts and ideas uh being placed on this on this movement and this signing maybe that's some that's another conversation that we can have with um with government officials on these videos and this big 150th anniversary but um, so these are the kinds of thoughts that are going through my head after watching these videos. And I just want to say a big thank you to MA and, and to Rachel and to Danielle for, for, for making these videos. After I had watched them the first time, I was just like mind blown. I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> they're so great. And it really gets you to think about uh, what needs to be done in our future for future steps and future goals on how to protect our lands and our waters and how to, well, technically how to save them, right? Oh yeah, sorry. And then you wanted me to say what land back meant to me. <laughs> uh, so for me, um, I know a lot of it is about, uh, well, from first glance, you think land back is like this big movement. Um, you see uh, uh, land guardians and water protectors at the, at the, at the front lines of, of, of these news stories that you're hearing about. But for me, it's, it's about reconnecting to the land it's about our relationship and restoring that relationship to the land. And then also, um, I think about when I think about land back, I think of reconciliation, really, we hear and see and I've, I've heard many elders and many people talk about truth and reconciliation and what we can do to get closer to to recon reconciliation in Canada. But can we even have reconciliation without giving the land back to Indigenous peoples? And I honestly don't think that we can. And this is this is what needs to be done if Canada really wants to reconcile the traumatic past that they've bestowed upon Indigenous people. Thank you, Taylor, for um, bringing together so many important things that come out of that about the relationship between land back and reconciliation, any particular definition of it and also about rights and responsibilities, um, which is something that I think the film really does uh, focus in important ways. So Danielle, I'm wondering if we could turn things over to you to, to either give us your impressions about the films and your how, how you see Land Back. Sure, so this was the first time that I saw this video in particular. I watched the other two um, earlier and I left this one so that it was more of like a, a blind react as the kids call it these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was really moved. I'm a very visual person and a lot of the images of I don't know more um, in Ottawa brought me back to when I was actually living there. When I was 18, I, I left home uh, to go and pursue my undergrad in visual arts. And I wanted to get away as far as possible from my family because they're so, so big and so caring uh, in the most overbearing way that I just wanted to branch out. And I lived there for seven years. Um, and in that time as a young adult, as a young Anishinaabe uh, Kwe, I don't think I really understood the uh, importance of the land in which all of the, the conflict uh, and the actions were happening. Um, and in the same year that all of that was happening, I don't know more, all, all the people gathering. I mean, it was amazing how many people were actually in Ottawa at that time because there was an AFN General Assembly. So you had people from all across Canada. Uh, my dad had passed away that year and I felt this huge disconnect to my identity as Anishinaabe Kwe being of uh, mixed background. 
Um, and so it was maybe about a year later, I decided to move back home or be closer to home. Um, and it wasn't uh, with the purpose of being on the land, it was actually being closer to my family so I could support them in this really um, new journey in our, in our life without uh, a main figure. And so I, I spent a lot of time uh, grieving on the land, grieving and the water. And, um, and then as I got older, living in Winnipeg, I, I really grew to appreciate how close home was to me. Home is uh, Kenora, Ontario, uh, part of Treaty 3. And I think about the, the times that my dad would take us out on the water um, on Lake of the Woods, and we would make that offering of tobacco for a safe journey, um, how close we were to the water and the land. I grew up in Longbow Lake, uh, was raped uh, beside a, a large lake, and dad used to refer to it as Longbow Lake First Nation, so that was land back in its uh, best form. It wasn't actually a First Nation, but in, in his mind it was, and I actually uh, still refer to it as that. And then um, I, I got pregnant and I had my daughter and I labored uh, in the water on my home territory. Um, and then when, when she was born, I actually um, handed over her placenta to my mom and she was able to bury it in our backyard. Um, and that was a traditional practice that I wasn't really aware of. So land back to me, and watching this video, um, it brought back a lot of, you know, what my personal journey has been with Land Back. Like, I think as a lawyer, people kind of expect that I might have like, you know, some sort of legal jargon or, you know, I might be referring to uh, like treaty relationships. But for me, Land Back has been a very personal journey as I've been able to um, fast for the first time for four days um, and really reconnect with the land and water and learn to appreciate uh, water as that life-giving source and what water and the land has meant for me as a mother and being able to raise my daughter with the same appreciation and that same um, relationship and responsibility to the land uh, that she now has um, as a young girl. So um, in a nutshell, um, I, I think the video is just so well done and I love the, uh, the variety of voices that are represented. I, um, in the same light that Taylor has uh, said, I'm just so grateful to the team for putting together such a wonderful series. Thank you, Danielle, um, for pulling together um, a whole range of issues that, that, that this conversation in these videos prompt, um, including particularly the, the particular relationships of, of women and um, Anishinaabe Kwe in particular women in other respects um, to territories and waters and um, how this informs these questions. Um, I'm wondering if the panelists, if everybody who's sort of on the panel here has any questions or um, points you'd like to raise with one another um, at this point. Yeah, I'd love to jump in and I'm listening to Taylor and Danielle and thinking there's actually, uh, I think, a generational divide between how people think about land back, both from Indigenous and non-Indigenous perspectives. And I'm throwing this out there as a theory, um, <laughs> but uh, from what I've heard of people that are younger, um, and I'll put myself in the young category just for fun. Uh, <laughs> we kind of look at land back as land or back to land, going back to land rather than strict ideas of taking back land or um, repatriation of land or creating um, corollary structures of ownership of land. And uh, so it's it's been really interesting to see sort of the personal um, dimensions and the personal journeys and how people are returning to land, like Taylor, like you're doing with your land-based education and Danielle, what you've just described to us in terms of fostering your relationship with land. And I felt something very similar when I did my graduate work in Victoria, I couldn't write there. I had to come back because I was writing about my territory. I had to be in my territory to 
to write. Um, and so although, you know, being at an institution was generative in a lot of intellectual ways, the heart work, and like not hard, well, hard, <laughs> hard and heart work had to be done within, within the, my home territory. So I think that, you know, there are important uh, differing perspectives and I don't want to lump all young people and all older people into categories, but I've noticed that this is kind of a generational thing where, um, you know, repatriating relationships to land doesn't mean falling within sort of Western paradigms of ownership. And I think that that's really encouraging because it helps this conversation that is, um, that is generative. And maybe my other observation is it might actually be connected to how as treaty people, we view the relationship of sharing. Um, Cause right now we're, we're talking to you and we're all coming from a perspective of, of being treaty uh, descendants. Uh, and people who, you know, are, are committed to a treaty relationship. And I think that also shifts how you think about what, what land actually means in creating those relationships and, and those opportunities to think about how we navigate this delicate relationship over land, um, at, on land and, and, and on water that um, has had some time to manifest itself. Not particularly well, as you pointed out, Taylor. Uh, you know, we have some undoing to do. We have some flaws in the treaty relationship, but that core of what was what was settled in in the the negotiations and what the intent was of Anishinaabe representatives in Treaty One was really to be uh, to continue to be connected to that land, to belong to the land, which is, I think, a very important piece that I'm hearing reflected in in how. Um, a lot of Indigenous people are, are approaching land back. Um, I, I have been thinking a lot this week about um, Treaty 1. And I was grateful that you reminded us of that, Taylor. And, and I've been thinking about Treaty 3 negotiations too, in terms of how we, um, we develop these relationships of, of sharing. And one of the things that, that's come back to me is the story um, that's retold in the archive about uh, Aitapu Peitang, who is the chief, and he shows up completely covered head to toe in white mud. And he, um, and that's defining of where he's from and, and the people that he's representing in the treaty discussions, and basically says, try and take this from me. Like you can't. And I also can't actually sell it to you or give it to you. Um, because I belong to it. And I think that that's such a powerful visual representation of belonging to land. And if you think about land as mother, um, which I hope many of us are doing today on, on Earth Day and thinking about a sacred relationship with a mother, then that changes the sort of normative implications of how we relate to each other about land questions uh, and about land back. So I'm really, yeah, I'm glad that um, we're all able to, to spend this time and, and have this discussion. Absolutely, thank you very much uh, for all of that. I don't know if, if any of the other panelists have anything immediately that you wanna add or respond to, Taylor? Well, I just, um sitting here kind of contemplating how we can change this narrative from from people thinking about rights as opposed to responsibilities and i'm thinking of like how i can in ways in which i can do this at the university as as a student through um the student group you mice whether it be through the work because uh, the work i do as a land-based educator is all with um, indigenous youth across manitoba and northwestern ontario so going into the summer camps these land-based camps that we um, have planned and scheduled for this coming summer it's really it's really going to help me change that narrative within these land-based camps from rights to responsibilities from ownership to to um to responsibility as well so um i just i just can't i can't say it enough but just miigwech forever all the all the amazing insights that that have been in that that were included in these videos so you're giving me whole different ways of thinking about about life <laughs>
Great. Thank you, Danielle. Did you want to? Yeah, I was um, listening to Amay's, uh, I guess, characterization of how our generation views land back. And I think I've heard um, amongst my generation that being able to go back to the land and learn, you know, our language or culture, it's considered a real privilege uh, and it's very inaccessible. Mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of young people, especially if you're living in an urban area. Um, and I think that is a call to action to create more of those opportunities um, within classrooms. So I really appreciate the work that Taylor, you're doing and making those opportunities and access happen. Um, and, and not just uh, within secondary education, this should apply for law schools um, medical schools, that there is so much that we have to learn from the land. Uh, much of our, our own sacred laws and natural laws are attached to land. And I, I think back to my time and being at the Nibi gathering and how special that was and how formative it was in my learning experience. Um, and that I was extremely lucky to be able to um, attend that as, you know, part of my education in law school. And also as an articling student, I was given the okay to attend and have that be a, a part of uh, my, my hours that go towards becoming a licensed lawyer. I think it needs to be normalized. You can't necessarily look as uh, education is only happening in the classroom because many young people have to leave their homes in the way that I did. Uh, in order to pursue the education that we need to survive uh, in this world. And it shouldn't be like that. That's not what our understanding in terms of signing a treaty was. It, it was supposed to be that we would have the same access to education, healthcare, uh, mental health support services. And that's just not the reality right now. So that means that we have to work even harder just to get the basics. So I think, um, you know, I hope people that have tuned in take that as, um, you know, people are always asking, well, what can we do? Like, should we abolish the Indian Act? I sort I saw a comment um, in the chat. It's it's responding uh, in a meaningful way to young people, especially who uh, are really feeling that loss and don't really re realize it until uh, they've spent so much time in a you know, Western oriented space. I'm 34 years old and I uh, have an undergrad, a law school degree, and it, it shouldn't have taken me this long to realize I should have just been able to learn these things at home. Thank you for that. So um, we have a couple of minutes to take questions from the, the folks that have joined us online. Um, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the chat here where um, CHR manager Justin Rasmussen has, has put up a bunch of really helpful links. And Aimee has also noted that the Nibby gathering, which Danielle referred to, will be online this year. And we have a link for that. And that is coming up in the next month or so. Um, so I, I'll, I'll turn your attention toward there. We have one question um, already from Shirley Thompson, who says, much gratitude for the profound video, which is really a call to action. And what she asks in particular is whether um, relinquishing or changing radically the Indian Act is a necessary step towards land back. And Danielle has already kind of spoken to that question. Um, but I wondered if that was something um, that others would also see as um, something they might want to weigh in on here. If I can uh, sort of comment further on what I was sharing, um, I do think that it's a necessary part because my life is governed by the Indian Act uh, and there's still a lot of gender disparity within it, but there, it, it can't be that in and of itself. And there's, there's so much more towards um, sovereignty, like true sovereignty for First Nations. And I'm actually not really sure what that looks like. <laughs> I've just been kind of, you know, the, what I try to do as, um, a professional and as an Anishinaabe Kwe is I learn my, I try to learn my language. I try to understand my culture. I work with First Nations people 
who are uh, drafting their own laws. And I feel that, you know, that is supporting sovereignty. Certainly having the Indian Act uh, relinquished would remove a lot of barriers, I think, for First Nations. Um, and it's, there's definitely more to it. Yeah, the abolishment of the Indian Act has been a pretty significant debate. And um, I don't think anyone on this panel um, will be um, will remember directly the white paper, but that was the Trudeau initiative in 1969 to abolish the Indian Act. And it was met with a lot of resistance because one of the things we need to think about is how colonial structures um, and capitalist structures imposed on Indigenous people then become unraveled. And what happens when you unravel threads, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and what's that process un uh, uh, of unraveling? And like Danielle's saying, you know, the, the imperative of Indigenous self-determination alongside an unraveling of the Indian Act is going to have a lot of nuances to it and it will take time. Um, and it, it will take some significant thought and it's gonna look different in different places based on different nations, priorities and visions of um, the future, but also what we've been gifted in terms of what our ancestors have left for us. So, you know, I don't think there is one answer to that question. And I think it's one that needs to uh, evolve over time. What I think is interesting is thinking about the Indian Act as a tool of oppression um, that kind of anchors itself in the Canadian constitution and the federal government's res responsibility or, or power over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. This is a section of the Canadian constitution that says you have legislative power to make decisions um, over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. And that's the technical legal language that's used in the constitution. Now, how do we disengage from that and think about, you know, for example, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and current legislation that's before parliament um, and thinking about, you know, the principles and values and rights that are contained in that, that are all rooted in self-determination. Like how do we head towards that? and think of that unraveling as part of it and also look to um, how we need to unravel other parts of the law like in the common law how we've framed treaty rights and aboriginal rights as being subjected to doctrine of discovery and terra nullius these ideas that somehow land was open to be taken up um, in defiance of the original sovereignty of indigenous people within territories. So there's, you know, there's a lot to uh, to unpack. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot to be uh, negotiated, and uh, that has to happen on a nation to nation basis, and it has to be founded in the common objective of having right relations. Well, um, I'm going to take that as a as a moment that that kind of draws many of the themes that have come up in the videos and in our I think really rich conversation um, about them, and um, say that one of the questions um, that we thought about kind of concluding with is is what opportunities do, does land back uh, present? And I will just draw your attention to a couple of the quite specific opportunities that people have mentioned in the chat. One is the Nibby Gathering, which will be online, and that's from May 27th to 31st. Um, Taylor has also um, dropped in the email and the website for um, land learning. So if you're interested in planning a workshop or camp for your community, she um, gives us some links to follow. And we also have the links provided here to the other videos that are the companion pieces with the one we saw. And I will also um, just take a moment to thank um, CHRR manager, Dr. Justin Rasmussen for all of um, the work pulling this um, event together. And also thank Nikita Longman for um, contributing an article um, on the event. One thing that we have um, to conclude with as well is that our friends at Briar Patch Magazine have um, gifted us with a couple of um, issues of their special land back issue. And we will be, I think, drawing a few folks who registered for the event and sending them um, their very own uh, 
edition of that briar pitch issue in the mail. So um, with that, I will ask um, everybody to join me in offering um, enormous thanks to everyone who was involved in putting together the video and making it available to us and for joining us today for what was, I think, a really um, important discussion drawing out the connections um, between Land Back and Earth Day um, and a conversation that we definitely need to have in these places and on this particular day. Thank you very much.